Good morning and welcome to Thursday morning ladies breakfast Bible study. Uh, oh, it just says that you're now live. I thought we were live a few seconds ago. So I'll say it again. Good morning and welcome to Thursday morning's ladies breakfast Bible study. For all of you ladies and gentlemen and uh, young people and uh, post teens and whoever you are, wherever you are, uh, we're glad you're here. And it's, um, it's an exciting day and to serve the Lord and uh, know that he's with us. Uh, we've had a difficult week in our country. Uh, and so we, it just says again, over and over, um, in, ever, in so many circumstances, um, how much we need him. So we wanna finish up um, Jesus' words about love. Uh, he spoke a lot about it, but this particular verse is about how to deal with people that are not that nice. And he really um, floored his audience when he said, you've heard it said that you, that, you, that you do this according to the law. And they were like, yeah. Then he said, but I tell you this. And then he said these crazy things to them. Uh, and they're still amazing to us. Even we were like, really? He said, love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you and bless them that curse you. Wow. Amazing. These are amazing words because they're only words until you put them in practice. And then they become the living word of God in us. And it's, it's the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit in us. So today we want to talk about the last two that I want to get to, and that's to do good to hateful people and pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. So it's 902, so I'm going to get started, okay? So do good to those that hate you. One of the things that I was reading when I was studying about this was so, um, one of the commentators said, you could sort of see this as a challenge, like uh, I'm not going to do what the enemy wants me to do, and that's to do uh, you know, to either ignore hateful behavior or to get back at the hateful behavior or, uh, you know, pray against that person. Uh, he said, no, you could almost see it as a challenge saying, I'm going to do good. But of course, the, the, the problem with that is, is that we just can't decide to do that. Uh, that does not come in a natural sense from us. It comes from the supernatural sense of God in us to do good to those that hate you. In the history and just studying history, I found two very interesting examples. Um, and that one of them was Abraham Lincoln who was um, criticized about speaking compassionately about the South and the people that lived in the South. They were on the other side of the Union Army. But this is what he said, this is his quote. Do I not destroy my enemies when I make them my friends? So he put this into practice doing good to those that hate you because he was terribly hated. And the the people in the North and a lot of the um, Washington crowd hated the South. And so this was, this was his attitude. If we make our enemies our friends, then we have won. And then <clears throat> this other thing I found in history was this, both Ronald Reagan and Pope John Paul, they were shot 44 days apart in 1981. I remember that so well. But they both began immediately praying for the person who would be their assassin, who was the would-be assassin because they both lived. After meeting with John Paul, the Turkish gunman converted, converted excuse me, to the Catholic faith. God changed this man's heart. And he did it through the person of John Paul, who did good to him, met with him. And I don't know what happened, but told him, I, I prayed for you. Um, so a hater was turned because of something that was good that was done. And that had to come from a heart. It wasn't a perfunctory thing that either of these two men did, the prayer. It was from their heart. So God's supernatural goodness in us, it's, it's wielded as a great and incredible weapon because the line of Judah through us uses it as you wouldn't think that, would you? that goodness could be used as a weapon, but certainly in the hands of God and through us, his kids who are so, um, so fragile in our flesh. We so live in our flesh. When that's done, it gets the attention 
because it's supernatural. It's not something that we can just do on our own. Or if we do try to do it on our own, it doesn't carry the power because it's done for other, other reasons, but done for the right reason to obey the Lord and to have our hearts melted in compassion. It can be a tremendous um, weapon of good. And, and for us to ask ourselves, what is the reason for this? It's important to ask that question of myself and yourself. What is the reason that I'm doing this or the reason that I've chosen to do this? So we don't love the world. The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And of course, we are in the world. But this means that we don't, um, we don't take the world on as our, uh, as our clothing. We don't think like the world's uh, mechanisms. Uh, it, we, we, don't, we don't embrace the world. We are in the world, but we don't, we're not of the world. And so we, we want to reject un, the ungodly world because they, the world does not receive the Lord. But we want to have compassion for those that are in the world. The, the, um, the spirit of the world is what we reject in our hearts, what we come against in our heart. But our hearts have to be compassionate to those who the world's angry anger at God and defilement and defying of God comes through lips that look just like ours, our neighbors and our friends and people that we work with. Those who hate us and hate the Lord in us, especially because a lot of, you know, Jesus said, if they hate you, it's often because of me in you. Um, and sometimes it's because we just are do stupid things and are deserving of their derision. But if they, if the world hates us because of the, the Jesus that we carry within us, we have to remind ourselves that they need the goodness that we carry, even though they're rejecting, they need it. They are the ones, those in the world that have received the lies of the enemy, they are the ones that are lost, enslaved, deceived, without hope and in darkness. So that should produce compassion in us for people that maybe say hateful things and do hateful things. That's what the Lord is saying to us. That's what Jesus was saying. He says, do good to those who hate you. And so it, it, it begs the question on my next page. Well, what does that mean? Is, is it a list of things that I'm supposed to do? Well, it's not so much about that as it is about a heart posture that we connect to our culture. Um, hatred in our families, you say, could there be Oh yes, I know that to be true. There's estrangement and bitterness that can come in families. And <clears throat> that has to come under the blood of Jesus, where we ask ourselves, Lord, what is it that you require of me? What is it that I need to do to, to estrangement and bitterness and hateful words that are said and hateful actions that are made within even family members, much less those on the outside? Uh, and so, and so that's the question. What, what do you mean? Do good. What, what does that mean? Jesus taught a standard that was a lot higher than just doing stuff, but it's the attitude of the heart and it changes everything. The minds and the motives of this, of our spirit is what propels us. It's the engine room of how we live is what's in our heart. You know, the scripture as a man thinketh in his heart, that's the way he is out of the heart proceeds the issues of life and and death and all the issues of life come out of the heart. And it doesn't mean our beating heart, boom, 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 but it means the, the, the center of who we are to our heart and our soul, what produces thoughts and actions comes from here to here and then out into our actions. And so um, hatred is a, it's a big word to those who are hateful to us, filled with hate. That's a huge word. Um, I was always taught you only ever hate the devil. You never hate people ever. You may hate what they do and hate the actions like we have seen this week in our culture. You hate that, but you don't hate the person. And that come that has to come from the Lord because it's very, I mean, it's very slim there, you know, to put them all together. God doesn't want us to do that. He wants us to separate that and understand that the, um, the hatefulness that comes from the world 
comes usually through people. So I love the people that they come through to you. And I'm going to want you to use your creativity in me and my power in you to do good to those people that are hateful to you. So how do we do it? Here's some examples. Let's, let's talk about a difficult, mean, hateful boss. And you say, are there, are there bosses that are really hateful? I know that to be true. I never experienced that. I had an incredibly wonderful boss for many, for all my, almost all of my um, working experience was was in one office and he was incredible. So I'm not speaking of this from personal, but I know this to be true from people that I know that are are in my family, that there are bosses that have power over you that can be hateful. Um, so what do we do as we go before the Lord? And Because it hurts. It hurts to have hateful things said and done on purpose to you. So I thought of some things that we might do uh, for a hateful boss is to come in a little early. Really? Only if the Lord directs you, but if your heart's open to him, he might say, yeah, come in a little early and get started. Or if there was extra work to do or a, a, a job that nobody really likes, you volunteer to do it. I'll do that. Or um, I'll help to clean up after um, a meeting. Um, I'll be glad to take out the trash. Really? That's for our cleaning people. Sometimes it's for us to do to take out the trash or helping someone else. I'll be glad to help her to learn how to do that. Yeah, let me help you do that. And and the boss sees that. Or a note to thank him for, let's say that you got a, um, a, a, a bonus of some kind or just something that was done. A simple note to say, thanks a lot for that. I really appreciate that. Or that was really helpful to me or whatever. Just small things like that. And again, this can't be done out of manipulation. That's not how it works. It's not done because, um, oh, this will get him. <laughs> No, it's got to be done from a contrite heart to say, Lord, I know you love this man or this woman, or maybe it's a couple of them that have um, authority over you. You love them and, I, and you live in me. So show me ways to show them who you are and that you're real and that I'm not going to come back in the same way that they come at me. So why do we do good? We have to do it <clears throat> on purpose. We have to do good on purpose. <clears throat> because of what I just said, uh, it's hard to think of doing good to someone that, that you feel like wants to harm you uh, to create difficulty in your life. But <clears throat> it's to show to the world, to that person, that boss, that supervisor, to show them who Jesus is, to represent him to the world who does not know him and who makes very, very broad assessments about what a Christian is. We have a chance to change those assessments into who God really is. Because <clears throat> what we have to remember is that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And that would be you and me. We were the ungodly. We were the ones that were hateful. We were the ones that were running away from God, that stomped our foot, that said no to him, that screamed. I mean, I don't know what your experience was, but we were the ones that were enemies and that God brought us near. I love that phrase. He brought us near. He found us. He convicted us and changed our life. <clears throat> That's the Lord that we want to show in our life. And that doesn't help happen naturally. But supernaturally, you can do that. So how do we genuinely, uh, oh, here's, and this begs the question. How is it that we could ever show love to a hateful person if we have a lot of trouble showing love to people within our own body, within the body of Christ? Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Are we are we um, kind and gentle and loving and forgiving to those people? How about to our own family members? Do we treat our family members that way when there's been a disruption, when they've stepped on our <laughs> on our feelings, <clears throat> but they're believers, but they've just hurt us? And it's been it's it, it felt like hate, but we probably know it really wasn't hate. But we have to ask ourselves. Can I really go into all the world if I can't keep the commandment to love? Um, it's really important that we look at ourselves and say, the commandment is a commandment. It's not a suggestion or when you feel like it or, you know, check a little box when it's, in, when it's convenient for you. But God said, this, Jesus said, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. It's a commandment. Do good to those who hate you. 
So we can do good to hateful people, to people that stomp on our feelings. Maybe they don't even realize they have, but in Jesus, we can do good for them. We can bless them. Do you have somebody in your life that's hateful to you? <clears throat> it could be a sibling. It could be a parent. It could be someone within the body of Christ that just, just ticks you off and just seems to always step on your toes. We can, in Jesus, do good to them, help them, bless them, return good for evil. That's a game changer because when it's from the heart, God frees us from being wounded because when we're wounded, we're vulnerable to many, many other things. We're weak. We can't stand when we're, when we're hurting. And what it does is when we're good in the power of Jesus, it takes the focus off of me and what's being done to me and the words that are coming here or the actions or the hurt and it puts it on him and we look to him who is the author and finisher of our faith. Then the Bible says, after that, it says, pray for them who despitefully use you and persecute you. What? Yeah, pray for those who despitefully use you. So I looked that up. Spiteful means malicious, nasty, and mean. And persecute, persecute means ill treatment and hostility towards someone, especially because of their race, political um, leanings or beliefs, or religious beliefs, their faith. Those are three very sticky things. You know, their race, how you believe in your heart, your faith, and also how you lean politically. They always say, don't, don't discuss those things. From the Greek, the word means this, and I thought this was amazing. Persecution means to literally hunt down like an animal and bring them down, to pursue and hunt them down. I think of like a, a a dog, you know, that, that um, hunts down uh, a, a dead body. They're trying to find out where that is or drugs. And he sniffs and he goes and then he 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 marks the, this is it, you know, and, and he won't stop till he finds that. And when he stops looking, it means the scent is gone. That's what persecution means. Hunting down, bringing it down, uh, pursuing and punishing and trying to suppress a person's conviction or make them feel horrible about who they are. Even um, that can happen even in our own own household. I know many people that have been uh, uh, the only Christian in their family, the only strong believer, and they have to pay a price for being ridiculed. And we, we might not think of that as persecution, but if you were on the other end, you might rethink that. Uh, yeah, that does really feel like persecution, you know, to be uh, scoffed at, you know, oh, you're, you're doing that again, or, you know, that's not really real and, and on and on. It can happen to people from people very, very close to us. That makes it really personal and very, very difficult. In the Hebrew, and you know, I love that word. The word is radaf, and it means to harass. It's like, I think of harassing, just picking, you know, constantly picking that. Uh, and, and after a while, you begin to get your, if, if somebody continues, picks at your flesh, your flesh gets wounded and it gets sore and it begins to open and we have wounds and that's where the enemy can come in. And so it means to bring ridicule and scorn and belittling. And Jesus, we know, was despised and rejected of men. So were his disciples, all save John were were um were martyred but before that they were jeered at and threatened and arrested and <clears throat> and uh, wounded and persecuted and uh tortured uh and then they like i said they all were martyred here's what it says in uh, second timothy 3 12 an amazing verse everyone who wants to live a godly life in christ jesus will be persecuted so it's going to come to us we will be persecuted um, it just depends on what we're talking about. We know very little about real persecution in this country, but persecution will come and uh, God will, um, will help us. I just want to make sure I got all those important points because persecution and uh, to pray for someone who is persecuting you, someone who's hurt you, again, it's a supernatural thing. And we want to talk about that. Uh, you know, we talked about how we bless those, you know, we bless those that are against us. And we, we talked about that prayer, Lord, 
show yourself to them, bring them close to you, find them, you know, redeem them, uh, do good to them. And as we pray for those who persecute us, it what it does is, well, there's two reasons to, to pray because God answers prayer. And you may be praying for something to change in that situation and God answers that prayer and something changes. Or what it does is it brings us close to the heart of God as we bring our brokenness to him and say, Lord, this is just so difficult. And this person or this situation is coming against you in me and my um, my faith in you and who I am as a Christian or or what I believe or my or my race. Um, and Lord, I, I'm asking you to intervene. And if you don't, if you can't, if that's not your will for me to get through this, then you bless me, help me, give me creative opportunities to be who you are to that person that's coming against me. Because a lot of times it's because a person that's doing that doesn't understand who we are, does not understand our faith, does not understand our race, does not understand where we come from. And so God can be very creatively give us opportunity to sh share with them uh, in his own way, who we are in him, in a way that will reveal and that could take the, the weapons out of their hands. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And, and that that enemy could become a friend. I believe that's possible. And I think that's happened. That's happened. I, I read to you a few weeks ago, the story of Nikki Cruz, who threatened to kill David Wilkerson on the streets of New York. Don't you ever talk about God here. And he became a believer and he and David Wilkerson worked together on the streets for years. And then he established his own ministry out in Colorado Springs. And so we know it's true that the enemy can be made a friend and the person that persecutes you can be someone who actually comes alongside you and is in the same ball game on the same side that you are. Because God alone is the only one that can change a heart of someone who's been hateful, um, hateful and, and ungodly to us. Um, it could be ours that needs to change. Have you ever thought of that? Sometimes when, when I'm praying for something, the Lord shows me, well, you don't have any control over that over there, but here you go, Nikki, I'm going to talk to you about you. And then I go, oh, really? I thought I was praying about, mm, no, we're going to, we're going to talk about you and how you're dealing in this situation or how you're dealing in general. And so many times the Lord has just nailed me, I call it, when I'm praying about something else. It's important to listen when he does that because he's a loving father and he wants us to be healed. So God's desire to help us in times like this, when we're facing hateful people who do hateful things that come our way, you say, well, how do I know what to do? The best way I can tell you is ask him. My, my few little pittance is not going to really do anything because God knows that person. He knows the whole situation. Ask God on our knees. What is it, Lord? Show me. Show me how to comport myself. Show me <clears throat> the proactive love steps that I can take in this situation. Let me see it. Drop it in my heart. Give me the opportunity. And he will, I promise you, when we fix our focus on him. I want to read to you now the testimony of Watchman Nee as I close. And it's a beautiful illustration. And it's extreme because we're not in the extreme yet. And so if this works in the extreme, then think how much God can work where we are. And here, I'm just going to read, the, read it because I don't want to try to paraphrase it. It's too powerful. Watchman Nee, the Chinese church leader, had only six hours. He must lead the guard in front of his prison cell to Christ so that the, his letter of encouragement to Christians outside the prison could be delivered. Chairman Mao, that's Mao Zedong, who killed about 20 million Christians. His government was infuriated by the spread of Christianity in China. In order to stop the spread of this, quote, foreign cult, as he called it, they had uh, forced out and killed all foreign missionaries and had sent thousands of Chinese church leaders to prisons or re-education labor camps 
but the church still grew. When the police discovered that Nee's beautiful, powerful letters of encouragement were making their way out of the prison and into the hands of Christians, they doubled the number of guards and never allowed a guard to stand outside of Nee's cell more than one time. They shortened the shifts to six hours, hoping that Nee would not have time to convert the guard. Nee told the guard about the father's love and his willingness to give up his own flesh and blood so that the guard could live forever in heaven. Communism cannot get you to heaven, he said. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can do that. Five hours into the sermon, the tears streaming from his eyes, the guard accepted Christ. Yet another soul was one for the kingdom and yet another of watchmen's knees letters would be safely delivered. If Christian martyrs taught us anything, it is that we can use creative energy in order to promote the gospel, what I just talked about. God's the great creative mind of the universe. If you don't know how to, to reach out to someone who's hateful or who's despitefully using you or persecuting you or uh, you know cursing you, all, all of those things, ask him, ask him how to do it and he'll tell you. Their integrity, ingenuity, courage, and even craftiness ought to awaken our own spirits for spreading the good news. While not everyone has the opportunity to smuggle scriptures into restricted areas, we can still see the willing servants. We can still be the willing servants for the kingdom. That's Watchman Nee's, uh, and I had I had read him before. He an, was an amazing man. And, and now I want to re read to you the end. He died in prison in 1972. He was put in prison in 1952. So he spent 20 years in a prison labor camp. His wife had died before him. His grandniece came to collect his body when the word reached the family that he had died. By the time she got there, he had already been cremated. But a guard gave her a piece of paper that was found under his pillow. It was written in a shaky hand and it testified of his life experience. Christ is the, this is what he wrote. Christ is the Lord God who died for the redemption of sinners and resurrection after three days. This is the greatest truth in the universe. I die because of my life and my belief in Christ. Signed, Watchman Nee. And so when we talk about doing good to those who hate us, Watchman Nee, while we go to the extreme, like I said, because none of us have been in a prison labor camp for 20 years, starved and beaten and tortured and threatened and losing family members when you're not even aware of that. None of us have faced that. But we go to that extreme to understand that God is in the extreme. So if he's in the extreme to show his power and love to those that are lost, that are hateful, that are guarding you to death, that will report you and will make your life even more miserable, then how much more will he be here with us, with words that are said to us, with hurts that come to us? We must put them in perspective and understand that we have an opportunity to be the hands and feet and the mouth and the, um, the, the essence of who God is to our culture. And sometimes it's right to the person right next door to us, our, our husbands and wives, our children, our parents, our brothers and sisters, and our aunts and uncles, someone that we haven't talked to in years because of a hateful word. We can fix that. We can. We can find a creative way because God will show us how to bridge that gap and to bless those and to pray for those who despitefully use us. Uh, despitefully use us and persecute us and do good to those who are mean to us, who hate us and come against our faith. That's not, that's something that we have on the outside that we can do. You know, good Christian Vicky, she's up to it today. No, good Christian Vicky doesn't exist without the Lord Jesus Christ in my heart to live through me. That's what he wants to do. So let's pray together for opportunities we have. Maybe you already know who that person or persons are in your life, that you can right now pray, Lord, 
open up the opportunity, show me the way to show your love, to present to them so that I can bless those, so I can pray for those, so that I can love those, so I can do good to those. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the power of your word. We confess, Lord, that we have failed on so many levels of doing this. And we uh, wear our very small slights as badges. And so forgive us of that, Lord. In truth, we have suffered very little. We have been persecuted very, very little compared to so many of your, uh, of your children across this world. But for those things that have come to hurt us, Lord, that have separated, the enemy has used to wound us and to blow us out, out of relationship with someone, Lord, we bring that to you. We know that you died for those wounds and those slights and those hurts. We pray, Father, right now that you would visit us in our hearts. Give us a picture, a word, something to help us to know how to move. And if you don't do it right away, we, 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 we will continue to come to you, Lord, on our knees in humility, because we know that we have been forgiven our slight against you our great sin against you. You have brought us near. You have forgiven us. You have done good, only good to us who were your enemies. And so we know that you, you who did that for us live within us. So we have the ability to do that to others. We pray that we would put on this beautiful garment of love every day, Father, in all of its complexity and power of what you can do in our world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I'll see you next week with more um, goodies about love. God bless you.